very happy to welcome Richard Howitt, MEP, one of Europe's longest serving MEPs, first elected in 1994. Richard, you've taken the decision to stand down as an MEP after 22 years of service to this parliament and indeed to the people of the east of England. Why have you taken this decision now? Well, first and foremost, I've taken a decision to accept a wonderful uh, new role and challenge. And the point about the European Parliament is that we do really serious work here. And I've had the privilege of working as the Rapporteur on Corporate Responsibility here for in those four terms. We've completely changed the, the landscape on that issue in Brussels, and I'm pretty proud of my contribution to achieving that. And I'm now going to be going on to deal with those issues about how companies can adapt to uh, uh, their corporate governance, their reporting structures, to the wider concerns about climate change, about social equality, uh, equity in the world, about stability and all of the things that were behind the banking crash of 2007 and 8, the loss of trust. Those are issues I deeply care about. I've had the privilege of working on them at the European level and I've now got the huge privilege of being able to work on them at the world level. So it's, it, of course, with deep, deep sadness that I'm going to be leaving the European Parliament. Of course it is, right? But it is a very positive reason to take up a challenge in an area that I feel passionately that I want to pursue. Has the, EU's re the UK's EU referendum played any role in this decision? Obviously, the UK has voted to leave the EU your mandate would have come to an end in 2020. How, how, how important was that in making your decision? Well, the decision is the decision, as I've just said, but one of the things that I am saying is that I am not changing my views at all. This isn't about changing my mind. In Britain, politicians have to respect the decision. I regret it, but I want to make clear uh, that it's the wrong decision. I don't think that... Uh, Anybody in Britain should think, OK, it's all OK. It isn't, right? There are huge, huge problems for Britain. And when Leave uh, campaigners who are in government say there's a big new bright world out there uh, just waiting for Britain uh, and walk out tomorrow, trigger Article 50 yesterday, um, you know, all done by breakfast, it's rubbish, right? And there are real deep implications for businesses, for jobs, for trade, for people's rights. And at the moment, both major parties in Britain have got internal squabbles about all of this, and they haven't got any sort of unified conception of what they want to negotiate with our European partners. And I do think it's responsible for me, uh, as a member of the European Parliament, to say that there is still goodwill, there are still people in other EU member states who want to, to negotiate a better rather than worse deal from everyone's point of view. It is still possible for, for Britain to have a cooperative, positive, close relationship with our European partners uh, and it never has to be at the expense of relationships with other countries in the world. But Britain has to get its act together to negotiate that and I warn that that is not happening and the goodwill is seeping away. You're a member of the Labour Party, of course. With the exception, I think, of about eight MPs, the Labour Party were very much pro-Remain. Labour obviously aren't in gov government at this moment, but what role would you see them playing in the debate as it develops when we discover what Brexit means Brexit actually means? Well... Behind the scenes, Labour had a certain level of influence in the David Cameron package that he put to the referendum. Of course, the Tories are the government. And of course, there are lots of things that he said and did uh, and agreed that Labour didn't agree with. But we did have an impact. Uh, uh, we were consulted by uh, civil servants uh, and we did uh, get listened to. Uh, and I hope and believe that that should happen now. If Theresa May has got any sense She's got to not just try and unify the Tory party on this and deal with, with this as a, an issue of domestic British politics, and that's the danger of what we're seeing at the moment. She's got to be a Prime Minister for Britain, and that means involving the other political parties and involving wider interests uh, in this in an inclusive way. I don't yet see much sign of it, in all honesty, uh, but she is being tested on that. She is a new Prime Minister, 
uh, and I hope she will pass the test. I was wondering if you could say something about the impact that the referendum has had uh, on your own constituency, East of England. You were a councillor in Harlow in Essex uh, before you were an MEP and uh, there was a very well publicised hate crime against a Polish man in that town recently. Do you see a rise in hate crime across your region or is this uh, is this just an, uh, an exceptional moment? Uh. Well, firstly, there have been some economic consequences. Ryanair have pulled some routes out of Stansted Airport. Airbus have announced that they're looking to make investments outside Britain. They're a big employer in Stevenage. So they're, some of the economic worries that we have uh, uh, are being realised. One hopes that they won't be magnified. I'll still be working in my remaining time and my successor to try to make sure that doesn't happen because none of us, when making those warnings, wanted the bad economic impacts that, that we all fear, but I'm afraid we see some signs of it. But as you rightly say, the wave of political hate crimes against international citizens that we've seen right across Britain, there can't be a coincidence because the language and the content of the referendum campaign has legitimised, sadly for a few people, some very ugly and horrible views was realised in that attack in Harlow and uh, the devastation for obviously the families involved. Yeah. You know, it's so important that Polish ministers flew into Britain. Yeah. And as you rightly say, I was leader of the council in Harlow. This is a town I really love and I so closely identified with it. I was part, it's a new town. Uh, and I was part of the development of it and it's based on creating a community and great community solidarity and the idea that that community has been broken up and the trust uh, broken up by introducing hate and hate crimes I just find that so horrifying so horrifying but I had an attack on a Polish shop in Norwich an arson attack uh, and others throughout the region and it's happened throughout the country and I just think those people who said in the referendum campaign those of us were arguing for a main that we were scaremongers and so on and you know this is deeply horrible terrible for our society okay and those on the other side of this argument they might have won the referendum that that argument must be respected but they should understand their responsibility for some of the things that we're seeing today. Moving on to your work in the Parliament, one of the areas that you've campaigned on, I think probably all your, your uh, political career has been disability rights. Mm. And um, this week we see the Parliament discussing accessibility for all. Do you see this as a culmination or a stopping point on the road for uh, disability rights in Europe? Uh, one of the things is that I've announced my intention to resign, I haven't resigned and I've got some very important parliamentary work in my remaining couple of months here. Uh, one of them is a report on uh, re restoring and widening EU-Iran relations following the nuclear deal and that's been a really interesting piece of work, very proud of and I want to get that through and I think the, the region and the world can be a safer and better place if we realise some of those aims. But again, as you rightly say, my immediate job before coming here rather long time ago, uh, was working for nine happy years in a disability NGO. Uh, disability rights are an absolute passion of mine. In all of my 22 years here, I've been either the president or the vice president of the all-party disability rights group or intergroup. Uh, and a, a second area that I'm going to get all the amendments through, working with colleagues, uh, is on the Accessibility Act. So one of the biggest things if you talk to any disabled person is lack of access you know it can talk about everything else but if you can't get out of bed in the morning if you can't get on the bus if you can't get to go to the toilet right what rights can you have what quality of life can, can you have now the proposal brought forward by the european commission is extremely limited and won't change enough of those things in truth but actually commissioner Tayson, to her great credit has brought forward a proposal that she could get through the commission that had been opposed in other respects and it puts it on the table but i believe if we can get it right we can make a major major difference to the lives 
of 11 million disabled people in Europe and that's also something I want to significantly advance even in these final two months as a member of the European Parliament. You've been very active in uh, foreign affairs, particularly the EU's relations with Southeast Asia, uh, but an area where you were particularly vocal at the beginning of the year was the question of arms sales mm. to Saudi Arabia. Mm. Given the situation in Yemen, the horrendous humanitarian situation that is emerging there, recently we've seen a draft report from the House of Commons on this issue, also raising the issue within the UK, one of the countries that does sell a lot of arms to the Saudi Arabia. Uh, where do you think this debate will go from here? Is there any impetus within the European Council, within the Commission, to act on their own common position on the selling of arms? One of the criticisms that people sometimes throw at the European Parliament and the EU is that it's all a fudge and bureaucratic and technical, it doesn't make a difference, you know, we have compromises here and so nothing actually deep or radical is ever agreed. And it's just not true, and this is a great example. I, you know, my, the resolution that I negotiated for recognition of the Palestinian state, okay, it's not recognised yet fully internationally, of course, but we hope that resolution made a difference and we got it through with big majority. On Colombia, I've been a, a big vociferous critic of uh, uh, conflict and breaches of human rights in Colombia. We're on the verge of seeing an end of the 30-year civil war and I was in the, the peace talks between the former guerrillas and the government in secret, influencing it. You know, and though all of those resolutions made a difference. And on Saudi Arabia, uh, the situation in Yemen, humanitarian situation, is appalling. And because everyone was worried about Ukraine, and should be by the way, is worried about Syria and should be. No one sufficiently in the public sphere was looking at Yemen and the military uh, actions that the Saudis have led because the Saudis are an important defence partner uh, in the geostrategic patterns of Europe and the world uh, hasn't been subject to, to scrutiny. And so we produced a resolution here calling for an arms embargo and then delayed it to build support and to actually talk with the Saudis because the issue isn't passing resolutions, it's actually influencing and it was a good strategy to delay it. And then all the cynics said you've delayed it so that it can be swept under the carpet and you won't do it. And I said no, we will in good faith do it, but it's about actually trying to realise it. And when the delay happened we still got it through with a big majority. And does it make a difference? You're right to say of course that bloodshed is going on, right? Uh, and by the way, who are the biggest beneficiaries of that? Al-Qaeda. Because in the vacuum that is left in Yemen, Al-Qaeda are taking over vast swathes. That is not in Britain or, European, or, or the wider European, uh, European interest. But I know that that resolution made a difference because the European Parliament can send a very strong signal. Saudis didn't want it. They lobbied very hard against it, but I had the chance to talk that with them. I hope it influenced. Um, it clearly has uh, was widely reported, so it clearly has affected the, the public debate and has shone a spotlight on what's, uh, uh, on what's happening in, in the course of Yemen. But the biggest thing is this, they're in this wonderful world of social media now, which is great for democracy and human rights, if well used. Um, I've got so many messages from people sheltering in basements or parents who'd lost children saying thank you for getting that resolution through. And for anyone who is cynical about politics or just wants to be anti-European, it's one of many, many examples, but one I'm associated with, that shows that what we do in Europe makes a difference. Richard Howard, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.